Welcome to this month's Video Tech. In this release, we'll cover an operational overview and diagnosis of the MMC fuel system as it occurs on the 1989 and 90 summits with 1.5 and 1.6 liter engines and talons equipped with 2 liter naturally aspirated and turbo engines. In order to service the MMC fuel system, it's important that you have a solid understanding of the basic operation of an electronic control injection or ECI system. Let's start with the fuel supply system. The fuel supply system is comprised of electromagnetic type injectors, fuel rail, a fuel pressure regulator, and an in-tank electric fuel pump. After being filtered by an in-tank filter, fuel is pumped from the tank and is filtered again by an external filter before it is distributed to the injectors through the fuel rail. The pressure of fuel delivered to the injectors is regulated by the fuel pressure regulator. Excess fuel after pressure regulation is returned to the fuel tank. The injectors are activated on command from the ECU and inject the fuel into each intake port of the cylinder head sequentially according to the predetermined ignition order. In addition, on turbocharged engines, a fuel pressure control solenoid valve maintains idling stability immediately after restarting under high temperature conditions. It does this by allowing atmospheric pressure to act on the fuel pressure regulator, increasing fuel pressure. The engine control unit, or ECU, is considered the brain of the system. The ECU consists of a microcomputer, a random access memory, a read-only memory, and an input-output interface. The control unit determines the engine operating state based on various input signals it receives from sensors, and then controls and activates the necessary actuators to achieve optimum engine operating conditions. The ECU also has a diagnostic function which is primarily used to diagnose the sensors and outputs, thus facilitating system checks and troubleshooting. The self-diagnostic results are stored in computer memory. These results can be read by using the DRB2 with the MMC adapter and the new 1990 cartridge that works with all 1987 through 1990 Jeep and Eagle vehicles, 1989 and 1990 MMC vehicles, and the 1990 Talon from Diamond Star Motors. The diagnostic connector is located next to the fuse block in the vehicles. The diagnostic memory is maintained by the battery when the ignition switch is off. One way to clear the diagnostic codes that are stored in the ECU memory is to pull the 10 amp room fuse on both Summit and Talon models. The ECU also has a default mode and backup function. The default mode controls the system in the event of failure of sensors or other parts. The backup function of the engine control unit ignores the output signal of a failed sensor and instead uses a built-in program or set of values so that the vehicle may continue to function. The operating state when the backup function is being used is termed the default mode. And the ECU keeps the check engine light on during this mode. For example, if the coolant sensor fails, the ECU will switch to a default value of 176 degrees for fuel and timing calculations. Should the coolant sensor begin to work again, the ECU will again use the values that are supplied by the sensor and will shut off the check engine light. The fault code will remain in the ECU's memory until cleared. The ECU is mounted near the glove compartment on Summit models and behind the center console on Talon models. Now, let's look at the devices the ECU depends on for information, the sensors. In covering the sensors used by the MMC fuel injection system, we'll deal mainly with the ones that make this system unique in comparison with other systems used on Jeep Eagle vehicles. One of the unique sensors of this system is the airflow sensor. This sensor uses the Kármán vortex phenomenon to measure the volume of air that enters the engine through the air cleaner. 
The airflow sensor consists of a rectifier, vortex generating column, transmitter and receiver, amplifier, and modulator. The transmitter sends out ultrasonic waves. These sound waves travel from one side of the airflow sensor to the other. On the other side of the airflow sensor is a receiver. The amount of time it takes these sound waves to travel from the transmitter to the receiver without airflow interference is called the reference time. As air passes through the airflow sensor, it hits a triangular shaped object called a vortex generating column. This object causes the air to swirl alternately clockwise and counterclockwise above and below the column. As the swirling air passes in between the transmitter and receiver, it interrupts the ultrasonic waves. Depending on the direction of the swirling air, the time it takes the sound waves to reach the receiver is either speeded up or slowed down compared to the reference time. So the wave's transmit time will be speeded up, then slowed again. More airflow will result in a faster analog signal or an increased hertz rate from the airflow sensor. This analog signal is then processed by the modulator into a square wave signal, or on-off signal. This on-off signal causes the 5 volts coming out of the ECU to be grounded by the airflow sensor. It is the airflow sensor's job to cycle the 5 volts on and off based on airflow. As a result, the ECU can count these cycles or hertz. If there's more air going into the engine, the ECU will add more fuel by increasing the pulse width of the fuel injectors. Because the airflow sensor does not detect manifold pressure, it cannot compensate for vacuum leaks. If there happens to be a vacuum leak in the system, the result will be an engine that is running too lean. Or if the vacuum leak is large enough, the engine won't run at all, or it will start and stall. A simple way to distinguish between the 1.5 and 2 liter airflow sensor is by the air bypass tubes. The 1.5 liter engine has only one, while the 2 liter has two air bypass tubes. On all MMC turbo engines, the airflow sensors use an 8-way connector, and all non-turbo engines use a 6-way connector. The extra wire on the turbo engines is called a reset pin. It's needed on the turbos due to turbo noise interference with the airflow sensor output. The ECU grounds the reset pin of the airflow sensor when it goes below 138 hertz. This prevents the turbocharger noise from affecting the ECU's perception of the airflow sensor's output. To look at the airflow sensor output, hook up the DRB2 with the MMC adapter and cartridge and go to the sensor output display for the airflow sensor. The range of the scale of the sensor display is from 0 to 1594 hertz in increments of 6 hertz. The rule of thumb for the airflow sensor output is that it should be steady at idle and it should steadily go up as the throttle is opened. Also located on the airflow meter is the barometric pressure sensor. It senses the barometric pressure and converts it to a voltage signal, which is then sent to the ECU. The ECU will then use this information for fuel and timing calculations. The barometric pressure sensor senses the atmospheric pressure, unless the engine is running and the throttle is opened. Then the sensor output will go down due to air cleaner depression. Air cleaner depression is nothing more than the normal pressure drop across the air cleaner at higher airflow rates. With the key on, the sensor is fed 5 volts and is also provided a ground from the ECU. The ECU reads the barometric pressure from the sensor's output. The higher the vacuum, or lower absolute pressure, the lower the output voltage. The opposite is also true. The lower the vacuum, or higher the absolute pressure, the higher the output voltage. Using this signal, the ECU calculates altitude and adjusts the air-fuel ratio and the ignition timing. Here are the output voltages of the barometric pressure sensor at different altitudes. At sea level, the output voltage should be 4 volts. At 1,970 feet, the voltage should be 3.7 volts, and so on. This chart can be found in the reference book accompanying this program.
Use the DRB2 to check that the barometric pressure sensor matches the barometric reading from today's weather report. The reading should be within 2% of the report. The intake air temperature sensor is also located in the air cleaner on the airflow sensor. The intake air temperature sensor will tell the ECU to increase fuel when the air temperature is cold and decrease fuel when the air temperature is high. This sensor has no effect on ignition timing. This is how the intake air temperature sensor works. Anytime the key is on, the ECU will send 5 volts to the sensor as well as through an internal 2200 ohm resistor to ground. The intake air temperature sensor is a temperature variable resistor whose resistance will go down as the temperature goes up. Depending on the resistance of the air intake temperature sensor, the voltage drop across the internal resistor will change. By sensing voltage drop across the resistor, the ECU calculates air temperature. Shown here are the output voltages which occur at various temperatures. You can check the intake air temperature sensor either on the bench with an ohm meter or on the car with a DRB2. The most important sensor in the fuel system is the crank angle sensor. The MMC fuel injection system uses an optical sensor distributor to determine crank position. In the distributor used on the 1.5 liter engine, there are two optical sensors. One is the crank angle sensor and the other is the top dead center, or TDC sensor. The signal sent to the ECU from the crank angle sensor will be used as an RPM input and also to determine injector activation and ignition timing. The TDC sensor cues the ECU when to start the sequential injector activation. In other words, the TDC sensor syncs the injector sequence order to the correct spark plug firing order. The engine will not run without the crank angle sensor. On 1.5 liter engines, the distributor is mounted behind the valve cover by the left strut tower. The optical distributor is fed 12 volts when the ignition key is on. Inside the distributor is a metal disc with slots in it. The four outer slots are for the crank angle sensor and the one inner slot is for the TDC sensor. Two LEDs are placed above the disc and two photodiodes are placed below the disc. As the disc rotates, it either allows the LEDs to shine on the photodiodes or blocks the light. When exposed to light, the photodiodes conduct current. The current turns on the base of a transistor which allows the 5 volt signal from the ECU to ground. When the disc rotates further and the slot moves beyond the space between the LED and photodiode, the current flow is stopped and the ground is removed from the 5 volt signal. In this way, the crank angle sensor will toggle or switch the 5 volts that comes out of the ECU. The ECU will then use this information for fuel and timing control. All MMC fuel injection systems with a DOHC engine use a distributorless ignition system. This system uses a device which works much like the optical distributor with a few differences internally. There are two TDC sensor slots, the number one slot and the number four slot. The additional TDC sensor slot is used on the DOHC engine to reduce the cranking or starting time of the engine. Without a number four TDC sensor slot, the crank angle sensor may have to turn a maximum of one revolution before the ECU would know which coil to fire. Having a number four TDC sensor slot reduces the cranking time to a maximum of one quarter turn of the crank angle sensor before the ECU determines which coil to fire. The crank angle sensor is mounted on the cylinder head by the thermostat housing. If you have a no start and suspect the crank angle sensor as the cause, hook up the DRB2 and the MMC adapter to the car. After keying in all pertinent information, select sensors from the main menu. Key down to the RPM reading. Crank the engine while looking at the RPM display. If the display is 200 to 300 RPM, then the crank angle circuit is not the cause of your no start. If the DRB2 displays zero RPM while cranking, 
The crank angle circuit has failed, and you must determine what part of the circuit has failed. Our next sensor used to detect vehicle speed is mounted on the speedometer in the instrument cluster. The speed sensor uses a magnet driven by the speedometer cable to determine vehicle speed. One of the functions the ECU uses this vehicle speed information for is decel idle speed control, which keeps the vehicle from stalling. Another sensor that affects ignition timing is called the detonation sensor and is used only on turbo engines. The detonation sensor senses spark knock, sometimes called detonation. This sensor is mounted in the engine block on the back side. A small crystal inside the sensor vibrates when spark knock occurs and produces a voltage. This voltage is sent to the ECU, which retards ignition timing and adjusts injector pulse width until the knock is corrected. The coolant temperature sensor, which is located in the thermostat housing below the upper radiator hose, tells the ECU when the engine is cold. The ECU uses this information to add fuel or advance timing. The ECU also increases idle speed when the coolant temperature sensor indicates that the engine is cold. This helps bring the engine up to operating temperature faster. However, the coolant temperature sensor has no effect on fuel or timing when the engine is up to operating temperature. Mounted in the exhaust manifold on the front side of the engine is the oxygen sensor. In order for it to function, two conditions must be met. First, exhaust gases must heat the oxygen sensor to operating temperature, and second, the sensor must detect a rich enough air-fuel mixture. The oxygen sensor then produces a voltage and sends it to the ECU. This voltage tells the ECU whether the mixture is rich or lean. The ECU responds by fine-tuning the mixture, adding fuel to lean mixtures and reducing fuel to rich mixtures. The goal is to maintain the air-fuel ratio of 14.7 to 1. The oxygen sensor has no effect on ignition timing. Another exhaust sensor used on all California passenger cars is the exhaust gas recirculation temperature sensor. This sensor tells the ECU whether or not there are exhaust gases flowing into the engine. If the EGR temperature sensor indicates that exhaust gases are not flowing into the engine when they should be, the ECU warns the driver by means of a check engine light. An important sensor used in MMC fuel injection systems is the throttle position sensor, or the TPS. Located on the front of the throttle body, this sensor sends a voltage signal to the ECU based on the throttle opening or closing. It differs from other sensors because it does not affect the base pulse width of the injectors. But it does affect their frequency if the rate of increase in the sensor position is high enough. Also mounted on the throttle body is the idle switch. This switch is used to tell the ECU if a closed throttle condition is occurring. The ECU uses this closed throttle information to accomplish two things, to attain the engine's target idle speed and to shut off the fuel during deceleration to prevent stallouts. Some additional inputs are sent to the ECU to maintain idle speed during the use of accessory devices. For example, when the driver requests air conditioning, the air conditioning switch sends a voltage signal to the ECU. Since the ECU is aware of this AC request, it can turn off the AC during high engine loads by cycling the AC clutch relay off. The AC clutch relay is mounted with the condenser fan relay and the condenser fan control relay. A power steering switch is used to notify the ECU when power steering pressure exceeds a predetermined level, for example, during parking maneuvers. The ECU compensates for this load by raising the idle speed. The park neutral switch indicates to the ECU that the automatic transaxle is in gear. The ECU uses the input from this switch to regulate idle speed. This prevents a fluctuating idle when the transmission is shifted into gear. When the gear selector is moved from park or neutral, the ECU temporarily increases the idle speed to compensate for this load. Then it establishes a new lower idle speed. Now that we've looked at the inputs of this system, let's take a look at some of the outputs.
Probably the most important ECU output is the fuel injector. The ECU uses the injectors to control when the fuel is delivered to the cylinders and how much is delivered. The fuel injectors are affected in one way or another by almost all input devices. The ECU provides a ground to the fuel injectors based on input from the crank angle sensor, the speed sensor, the knock sensor, the airflow sensor with barometric pressure and the intake air temperature sensor, and the oxygen sensor. Each injector is energized individually unless the ECU receives specific information from certain input sensors. One input device that causes simultaneous injector energizing is the coolant sensor. If this sensor detects engine temperature below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, all injectors are energized simultaneously. Another input that impacts the fuel injectors is the throttle position sensor. You'll recall that when this sensor detects a quick throttle opening, the ECU adds extra injections to all cylinders. We mentioned earlier that the 1.6 and 2 liter engines have a distributorless ignition system. This system uses two ignition coils in what's called a dual coil pack. This is how the dual coil pack and the ECU interact with each other. When the ECU sees high voltage from both the crank angle sensor and the TDC sensor, it interrupts the ground for the primary side of one coil, causing spark plugs one and four to fire. If the crank angle sensor is high and the TDC sensor is low, the ECU interrupts the ground for the primary side of the other coil, firing spark plugs two and three. During normal running operation, two spark plugs are fired at the same time. In addition to the crank angle sensor and the TDC sensor, the ECU controls ignition timing based on many of the input sensors described earlier in the program. The ECU also varies the amount of time primary current is flowing through the coils during cranking and to compensate for changes in battery voltage. The 1.6 and 2 liter engines use what's called an automatic idle speed or AIS stepper motor. Mounted on the throttle body, the AIS stepper motor is used by the ECU to govern idle RPM. It does this by regulating the amount of air that bypasses the throttle blades. The ECU looks to the coolant temperature sensor and the throttle position sensor and other sensors for signals as it controls the AIS stepper motor. Another device called a thermal wax fast idle air valve works in conjunction with the AIS stepper motor to supply additional air when the engine is cold. A third device called a minimum airflow screw allows adjustments to be made to idle speed. So actually, there are three devices that control idle speed, but only the AIS stepper motor is controlled by the ECU. On Summit 1.5 liter engines, a direct current motor mounted on the throttle body called the ISC motor regulates idle speed. The ISC motor works in conjunction with the idle switch, the throttle position sensor, and the ISC motor position sensor. When the idle switch is closed, the ISC motor is driven by the ECU. When the idle switch is open, the ECU drives the ISC motor based on the throttle position sensor. To send accurate signals to the ISC motor, the ECU also looks to the coolant sensor, as well as accessory load sensors like the park neutral switch, the AC switch, and the power steering switch. The control relay is mounted on a bracket in the passenger compartment behind the center console. The control relay will power up the following. The fuel pump, the ECU main 5-volt regulator, the airflow sensor, the fuel injectors, the purge solenoid, the EGR solenoid in California only, and the wastegate solenoid on the turbo only. On the 1.6 and 2 liter, the control relay also powers up the DIS unit, the AIS motor, the oxygen sensor heater, and the crank angle sensor. As you can see, the control relay is similar to Chrysler's automatic shutdown or ASD relay. Here's how the control relay works on the 1.6 and 2 liter engines. The ECU will ground one of the coils in the control relay when the ignition is turned on. This will feed everything except the fuel pump. One of the coils that switches the fuel pump feed on is activated by cranking voltage.
the ECU will ground another coil at more than 25 cranking RPM or more than 50 running RPM. If the engine has gone below the minimum RPM, the ECU will have a 0.6 second delay and then unground the control relay which shuts off the fuel pump. The dual overhead cam engines use a 9-pin control relay, whereas the single overhead cam engines use an 8-pin control relay. The extra pin is needed on the dual overhead cam engines to keep the control relay energized, allowing the ECU to go through a self-shutdown routine. So without the control relay, the engine will not run. On two-liter turbo engines, the wastegate solenoid valve is used to increase or decrease boost pressure and is controlled by the ECU. The ECU determines octane using the detonation sensor and will turn the wastegate solenoid on when premium fuel is used. This increases boost pressure. To minimize emissions, the ECU actuates two outputs. First, the purge solenoid. Based on information from the airflow and coolant sensor, the ECU will ground the purge solenoid. In a non-turbo engine, this allows manifold vacuum to purge or remove vapors from the canister. In a turbo engine, the air cleaner depression purges the canister. This allows fuel vapors to flow from the canister to the intake manifold. The second emission reducing output from the ECU is the EGR solenoid, which controls the EGR valve. The EGR valve performs three functions. It recirculates exhaust gases back through the manifold for reuse by the engine. It helps reduce harmful nitrogen oxides. And it assists the knock sensor by eliminating spark knock. As mentioned earlier, turbocharged... The safety recall detailed in this program involves all 1988 and 1989 model year Renault Eagle Medallion passenger cars. On these vehicles, a malfunction of the throttle cable over-travel mechanism may restrict the return of the throttle lever back to the idle position, resulting in the throttle staying partially open when the accelerator pedal is released. To eliminate this possibility, all involved vehicles must have the throttle cable replaced with a revised cable. For repair of affected vehicles, revised throttle cables, part number C3940408, are being shipped at dealer cost to all involved dealers. To begin the service procedure, from inside the vehicle, first remove the lower instrument panel cover and remove the carpet pad located below the steering column. For visual access, the bi-level air duct was removed earlier. Next, detach the plastic ring at the base of the steering column. Now, disconnect the throttle cable end from the accelerator pedal rod. and feed the clip through the hole in the plastic column ring. In the engine compartment, disengage the cable housing from the clip at the rear of the engine compartment and disconnect the cable grommet at the bulkhead. Next, disconnect the cable from the throttle plate. Now, disengage the cable from the bracket on the valve cover, remove the throttle cable from the vehicle, and set it aside for return to the warranty material return center. Remove the adjustment clip and the two rubber grommets from the old cable and set them aside for reuse with the new cable. Install the new throttle cable from the parts package to the bracket on the valve cover. Next, connect the new cable to the throttle plate. 
Now, feed the end of the cable through the hole at the rear of the engine compartment bulkhead, reattach the rubber grommet, and clip the cable housing in place. Next, from inside the vehicle, feed the throttle cable clip through the hole in the plastic column ring and attach the end of the cable to the accelerator pedal rod. Now reattach the plastic ring at the base of the steering column. Next, reinstall the carpet pad and the lower instrument panel cover. Ensure that the interior carpet does not interfere with the accelerator pedal operation. Next, fully depress the accelerator pedal and check the adjustment of the throttle cable at the spring housing adjacent to the bracket on the valve cover. With the accelerator pedal fully depressed to the floor, the cable should compress the spring into the end of the spring housing to three millimeters or approximately three thirty seconds inch to one eighth inch from the edge of the spring housing as shown here. If the adjustment is inaccurate, move the retaining clip at the bracket end of the spring housing until the cable is adjusted to the proper specification to complete the service procedure. Dealers are urged to give their full support to this important program by serving all involved owners promptly and courteously. For further information regarding vehicle lists, repair parts, service procedures, and claim reporting procedures, refer to the Dealer Safety Recall Notification Letter, number 487. Engines include a fuel pressure regulator solenoid controlled by the ECU. When restarting a hot engine, the engine controller uses this solenoid to raise fuel pressure and deliver more fuel to the injectors. This reduces the chances of fuel boiling in the fuel rail. Based on information from the air and coolant temperature sensors, the engine controller grounds this solenoid during cranking. This bleeds all vacuum to the fuel pressure regulator and raises fuel pressure by about 10 PSI. Unique to the turbo engine is the boost gauge, a current type meter. The ECU receives the intake air volume signal from the airflow sensor and the RPM signal from the crank angle sensor and calculates the engine load. Then the unit determines the boost according to the load and supplies current to the boost gauge accordingly. This concludes this month's release of VideoTech. Remember to use the DRB2 and the Powertrain Diagnostic Procedures Manual when diagnosing an MMC fuel system problem. And we'll see you next year on Videotech.